Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. China and Russia have begun an eight-day joint military drill off the coast of South China's Guangdong province, codenamed the Joint Sea 2016. The maneuver is the largest marine operation conducted under a bilateral framework that began in 2012. It is also the first time for such a drill to take place in the South China Sea. Is this a saber-rattling event in this area, as some foreign analysts and media have suggested? Moving to the north, China's top legislature has just confirmed the disqualification of 45 deputies from Liaoning Province for their involvement in electoral fraud. What message are the Chinese authorities sending through the dismissal? To answer these questions and more, we are joined in the studio by Teng Jianqun, director of the Department for American Studies at the China Institute of International Studies, and Anna Tangen, author and columnist. We also speak to Mr. Pavel Falgenhor, defense analyst in Russia via satellite. Welcome to our discussion here, gentlemen.、Mm -hmm. Let's look at the ele electoral fraud that took、mm -hmm. place in Liaoning.、Mm -hmm. What message does this send to the top legislature?、Uh, the announcement actually is continuation of our anti-corruption movement at this moment, and it's a very important part to have、uh, clean politics and clean dem democracy in China. And all the you know deputies actually used the money to get their you know、uh, seats as a deputy in the People's Congress. Actually, this is really a deep hurt for the people's feeling. And they worry about the uh, uh, quali qualification and also the equality of the、uh, people's democracy in China. So I think this is a, a clear-cut、uh, explanation to the outside world. China will continue its、uh, an effort in the anti-corruption movement, and also this is actually、uh, only beginning. I'm sure there should be other、uh, provinces, you know. And I'm afraid、yeah. many in China who follow this process、yeah. and the event believe this is only tip of a huge iceberg. Now, this sounds like a money politics, which is pretty common in the United States. What's different is that money politics in your country has been institutionalized and made legal. Is that the major difference between our two political <laughs> systems? <laughs> well, not necessarily when it comes to representatives who have to be elected, but in that case, it's about money. And the coziness between the donors and special interests and the actual、uh, legislators who they are, are electing. But in the case, of, as you're referring to, if you want to be an ambassador, make a large donation to a winning candidate, and your wishes will probably come true. But I, I, I really think this is a lead up to the. National Party Congress. Once you have a cancer, you have to remove it. Taking these people into the National Party Congress and having them、uh, actually affect、uh, what happens in the future of China would be disastrous. I mean, if you know about the cancer and you don't remove it, then you are、uh, guilty of malfeasance. And I think the, the Chinese government is being very clear about this. As they say, they're killing the chickens. Uh, in order to scare the monkeys, and I, I think there will be、uh, more of these, but I don't think it'll be as widespread as as you indicated. I think they're just simply saying the days of a cozy relationship when、uh, independent business people、uh, or private interests could pay money to the legislature in order to give them this honor of being a a representative are over, and that from now on only serious party members who are interested in the future of China are going to be elected. And this is, as you indicated,、uh, one of the top priorities. Priorities for、uh, Beijing at this point, but、um, some of my friends <coughs> may hope that our overseas viewers of the program may not may not be misguided by、mm -hmm. our use of wording such as electoral system. Because、mm -hmm. in our country, we don't have、uh, electoral or competitive uh, democracy. Uh -huh. That's why the Chinese authorities.、Uh, Refuse to call our P National People's Congress a parliament or、mm -hmm, a mm -hmm, Congress.、Mm -hmm, It could be called the National People's Congress, but it's not a parliament because there is no opposition、yeah. in the parliament, right? Yeah, we have、uh, People's Congress, and we also have、uh, CCPC. You know, something like a、uh, uh, consultant body. body. Yeah, yeah. So I think、uh, this is a very specific、uh, political system in China.、Uh, the Communist Party is the leading party. And、uh, since its founding, and since、uh, the founding of the PRC, and even today,、uh, the、uh, CPC is still the leading party in China. And、uh, actually, according to the、uh, country's law, 
this actually ratified by the war. And uh, also uh, the uh, CPC, uh, especially today, facing uh, you know, very serious challenge from the corruption, not only in the, the, the party. No, no, the the way, one of the things, if, if people yeah. are sitting and watching the show, they should be aware of a very profound cultural differences between consultative um, systems, which is part of the Asian uh, ethos uh, culture, and this kind of idea of demo uh, demo democracies where you have win-lose, where it's vote, uh, and you know one, one party gets above the other one. The fact is, I've, I've been present in many um, meetings where you've had people within the party who are vehemently mm -hmm. at very, very different ends of the spectrum, and they argue very, very uh, <laughs> fiercely uh, on their sides. But, but so, when so it comes down to a policy we, statement, yeah. they, they speak with one voice. Now, you could say that that's true in the party system in the U.S. It's supposed to be true of the government once it's formed, but it's just a different nuance to other things. And people have to start thinking about how things will change as you have a different kind of influence in the world, especially on this consultant. Yeah. Genji, we don't have a competitive democracy. We don't have opposition parties in the, in the mm -hmm. National People's Congress, or you may call them a lawmaking body at different levels. Mm -hmm. Then the question is very much about how these people's deputies uh, got elected, if it can be called election. Actually, it's uh, a very specific uh, you know, uh, procedure for the deputies to be elected. For example, you should be nominated by your uh, party group and by some other uh, community in the society. And then they can get the permission from the uh, party committee and then you, you'll be the deputy in the People's Congress. So we have uh, uh, different uh, uh, levels, uh, deputies from the county level, from the provincial level, or even from, in, uh, from some uh, functional ministry in China. They also have the you know, uh, conference for the CPC and something like but that. But I'm afraid our this friends in Europe and America would feel even more puzzled after your explanation <laughs> about <laughs> how these people's deputies got elected. But you're watching dialogue with yeah. Anna Tang and uh, Teng Dianqing. We are talking about why 45 people's deputies or uh, lawmakers have been dismissed by the top legislature. Is that an early warning against uh, potential uh, suspects who want to do much the same? Well, this is, of course, part of the anti-graft campaign launched by President Xi Jinping since three years ago. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll take a look at the joint naval drills between Russia and China in the South China Sea. So stay with us. The joint C-2016 drill between China and Russia will run for eight days until September the 19th. Real combat simulations are taking place in the eastern waters of Zhanjiang City in southern China's Guangdong province. Both countries have sent the cream of their naval forces, with eight ships and two submarines from China and five ships from Russia. The two naval forces will undertake defense, rescue and anti-submarine operations and also take on joint island seizing exercises and other combat training activities. Officials say real combat, digitization and standardization will be the highlights in this year's drill. The joint drill highlights modes of real combat as well as digitalized and standardized use of force. The drill features the highest ever level of real combat, making it worth watching. And from experience gathered in the last five years, we've formed a standardized process for exercises, which makes the operations more efficient and practical. Joint Chinese-Russian drills have become increasingly common in recent years. This week's drill is the sixth between the two navies since 2012, and the first time it's taken place in the South China Sea. Experts say the Sino-Russian joint exercise is a mark of the high political trust between the two countries. Some US media have viewed the increasing military cooperation as a threat to the US and its allies. But China's authorities said the joint drills focus on emergency responses under multiple circumstances. They add that the drills are aimed at enhancing the abilities of both China and Russia to counter common security threats from the sea and safeguard regional safety and stability rather than simulating an offensive against any third party. Well, I'm afraid the most interesting question for all of those who follow this program mm -hmm. on dialogue 
-hmm. I'm afraid is whether this uh, joint drill between Russia and China will target a third party. De despite the, all the official rhetoric, no, 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 we won't target anybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, many people say, well, this takes place against the backdrop of the growing geopolitical tensions in the South China Sea. And everybody understands that uh, the United States, uh, Japan, and uh, Australia hold mm -hmm. their joined the military drills there in the contested waters whilst this time around a similar one takes place off the coast of southern China. What do you think of this very interesting war game? Uh, any uh, joint military drills should have some target or scenario they should practice during the exercise during the drill. But any country you know, do, does not like to give a clear-cut explanation who will be the so target? It's a policy of this is actually it's a policy of ambiguity. Yeah. This is a, this I, I would is disagree. There's no ambiguity. This is an ambiguous target. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can say ambiguous, but I think it's very clear. This is tit for tat. Remember, the the, the U.S. and Japanese navies were talking about island defense mm -hmm. and uh, you know and aggression. I mean, the, the the U.S. has one of the largest uh, invasion fleets. I mean, the um, mm -hmm. the vehicles and men equipped to seize things all right, from uh, the sea. Uh, the China is growing theirs. Japan obviously has quite a bit. But you know, what you see here is you have the number one uh, and number five largest military powers, sea-wise, against, not against, but kind of in opposition to the number two and three, mm -hmm. uh, Russia, uh, Russia and China being those two. So you, you have this kind of very not good situation where it's things, but it, it seems to be escalating. I, I would, my only thing is, mm -hmm. if you start looking at the military stuff without looking at what China's goals are in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, the idea of trade and development, there's an incompatibility long term between these kinds of exercises and this going back and forth with the U.S., which I think is deliberately trying to push these buttons as a way of derailing China mm -hmm. from its Belt and Road Initiative, I think China loses in the end. As one of the biggest beneficiaries of uh, <coughs> globalization, China, of course, is interested in ensuring freedom of navigation and order of life. Let me cross over to Mr. Pavel Falgenhor, pa Pavel Falgenhor a defense analyst from Russia, for his uh, comments on the nature and purpose of this joint naval drill in the South China Sea. Hello, Pavel. My question is, do you think yes, the two militaries are seriously interested in protecting the freedom of navigation? Our American friends are so concerned about this catchphrase, freedom of our navigation. Do you think Russians uh, really uh, show its, uh, their interest in this, uh, uh, well, you know, very interesting phrase, very interesting wording? Well, basically, since both uh, Russia and China have been sending in the previous years uh, ships to the Indian Ocean, coast of the Horn of Africa, uh, to protect uh, navigation from pirates, yes, there, there have been involved there. There have been actually joint exercises in the Mediterranean <coughs> and the Black Sea. F uh, so, uh, the, yes, formally speaking, yes. But, of course, uh, this particular exercise also involves Russian Marines, uh, landing craft, and Marines with uh, heavy weapons and armor uh, performing a landing, which is, of course, doesn't really be, is not really connected to freedom of navigation. It's more of a sort of uh, uh, land sea operation. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, means that the uh, freedom of navigation is to some extent uh, cover. Uh, but on the other side, of course, Russia and Chinese military are not actually planning right now any particular military joint action against any third party. That's also true. Uh, but they're working out procedures of joint conduct which could be used if somewhere in the future the political leaders of in Moscow and Beijing decide that there is need for some kind of uh, joint action somewhere in the world. But Pavel, don't you think uh, there is the ongoing escalation of a kind of a, 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 a escalation of tensions in that you Americans, Japanese and Australians uh, do whatever we would learn from you. We draw inspirations, we learn from you, we maintain our oversight closely about your drills and then we come back and discuss our feasibility plans and discuss the purpose, the pattern, 
and we are doing our joint naval drills likewise, such as simulated seizure of the islands. What do you think of such kind of interactions between these two military groups? Uh, well, as far as I know from Russian sources, the Chinese side has been for some years kind of prodding uh, the Russians to take these jo annual joint military exercises more south to the more disputed waters of the South China Sea. And Russia has been somewhat gently resisting, but now has agreed. Of course, Russia has very close uh, friendly relations with Vietnam there in the region and for some time was trying to be a bit at hand's length from the uh, disputes uh, in the South China Sea but as Russia-Chinese relations become more and more important for Moscow Moscow has more or less agreed to go there of course Russia at the same time right now is trying to mend fences with Japan, the J Japanese Prime Minister Abe is trying to kind of bring Ch Russia closer to Japan at the same time maybe a bit further from China. Well it seems uh, these exercises demonstrate that his uh, efforts are not that very successful fully. Thank you very much. Pavel tries to be sophisticated in his mm -hmm. analysis about the nature of the drills, mm -hmm. perhaps to match the sophistication of the joint drill between Russia and China in the South China Sea, because mm -hmm. he talks about Moscow's close ties with Vietnam and the efforts to man ties uh, or fences with Japan. If you look at the, the recent conclusion of the economic forum in Vladivostok. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think of the nature of uh, the simulated seizure of islands? If you look at the history of the evolution, you know, China and Russia studied the maritime joint drill from 2012. At the very beginning, the two sides were very cautious to each other. They just uh, gave very significant symbolic, you know, uh, uh, items in the drill. But nowadays, I think the two countries, uh, you know, have already agreed to have some very s sophisticated items, for example, anti-submarine and amphibious warfare operation uh, in the drill. This just show the you know the relation between the two militaries had been greatly you know in intensified and uh, they all you know uh, willing to have such a cooperation and uh, I don't think such a uh, you know jail can have some a specific target any country can be the target of the military this is actually a preparation or the practice of the uh, procedures for the uh, maritime warfare for the two large countries in this region, that is to maintain the uh, freedom of navigation and the peace and stability. Jen, we've region. heard many different voices about the uh, nature of the joint military drills between Russia and China. Cynical voices inside and outside China say, can we trust Russia? If you look at the history yeah. of the Cold War and uh, during the Qing Dynasty. Uh, Americans, first of all, uh, Anna. Well, let, let me point out something that should be right. Next. There's a very different style, all right, between the Russian uh, Vladimir Putin's and his real politique. He does not make any excuses. He does what he believes is in the best interest of Russia, regardless. Versus China, who is very consultative, all right. They're trying to build coalitions. And they're trying to make larger trade groups. Russia is kind of uh, on the defensive against Europe and the U.S. because of the trade sanctions, the situation uh, in the Ukraine. So I think that they're different, very different styles. The, the, the two can get along. That's fine. But I would say that there's a different style. Second, there should be some real p attention paid. Asia now consumes one half. I mean, they buy one half of the arms sold internationally each year. This is the largest arms race since the Cold War, and it's all pouring into these areas. This is a toxic situation, all right? In term, and then my last point is the Freedom of Na Navigation Act, is, that's, that is a non sequitur. It doesn't work. The one country that is concerned about freedom of navigation would be China, because China has to import its resources and export goods. This is not true with the U.S. Now, so Jen, Jen that's, that's uh, your perspective nonsense. about the uh, issue of trust. Now, if we hold joint military drills with Russia mm -hmm. and share the same platform of uh, 
command and control, it means automatically we share information on the same platform. That mm. reflects a high degree of mutual trust, right? Yeah, this is a uh, political trust. Between but then, the on the other countries. hand, some uh, the cynical voices say th this kind of a mill to mill ties between Russia and China is not other than a marriage of expediency. Uh, let's uh, discuss this issue from another perspective. Actually, this is a common interest between the two countries. You mentioned in the history, uh, Russia did a lot of hurt, you know, on China. And uh, now, why the two countries gave such uh, good cooperation, uh, not only in military but also in politics in the world? Uh, this is actually the two countries now share the common interests for their own sake. For example, they while facing the uh, so-called uh, pivot or rebelling strategy and also the uh, sanctions uh, by the Western countries toward, the, to, toward China and Russia, they have to, you know, to join together to deal with such a challenge. This is a reality. You know, they, they should have uh, some you know, measures to be taken. But the two know. sides refuse to forge any formal military alliance. Yeah, this is actually a very ironical you know, issue. No any you know, no any country i mean uh, both uh, russia and china would like to have such a coalition because in such a coalition they should be a big boss they should be a follower something like the uh, airline by by the uh, united states and japan and uh, so for many years shanghai cooperation organization is not a military alliance it's um, a platform for all the party members to join together and to deal with the common challenge but i'm afraid that many people in europe and in north america label the shanghai cooperation organization as a semi-nato mm -hmm. having said this uh, no, uh, it's, it's, it's very different. It's just a question of understanding it. The, the Western press always portrays it in just one or two lines. But the fact is, it's, it's concerned about terrorism and trade and creating a peaceful environment that goes forward. Yeah, SEO is said to, uh, to be the mission of fighting three evil forces yeah, in exactly the wake yeah. of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of uh, um, the fact that we are not willing and ready to forge the military alliance, despite the fact that the U.S. enjoys uh, a legacy of five treaty alliances that comes from the Cold War. Well, I think China has studied carefully the alliances that were created during the First and Second World War and realizes that creating these can, in fact, lead to uh, even worse uh, scenarios. I mean, I think people are looking too much of this as a war game scenario, all right, game theory. You don't want to do this. I mean, this is what has happened in the past, and by all means, it's necessary to, to, uh, to not repeat those particular mistakes. And there, there is this issue. That, I mean, China recognizes that Russia, Russia's interests and its own will converge. Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, rebalancing the East, but they're not necessarily always going to be the same. So they'll continue those things. There's no alliance between Russia and the U.S. And, or China and the U.S. There's always going to be a three-person game in that regard. Well said. Let me go back to uh, Pavel. Hi, Mr. Falkenhor. We've been discussing the issue of a mutual trust uh, between Russia and China here in the Beijing studio, and you've heard everything, by the way. <coughs> this year witnesses the 20th anniversary of signing uh, a treaty uh, of, uh, you know, the uh, strategic partnership uh, of cooperation facing the 21st century that was first uh, kicked out, uh, inaugurated by late Russian President Boris Yeltsin and his Chinese counterpart, Mr. Jiang Zemin. What do you think of the, uh, the message that to this kind of a very special partner, partnership tries to deliver to the United States first, first of all, and then Japan, who tries very hard to manifest it with Russia at the same time? Uh, well, Chinese, as it was said, Chinese and Russian interests do a serious co coincide in different areas. Uh, and we can actually speak about a possibility of a, some kind of Shanghai organization being a military alliance of sorts, but with a very limited objective to keep stability in uh, Central Asia, former Soviet Central Asia, and prevent any. Uh, Islamist takeover there, you, I could envisage even joint military action by members of the Shanghai organization if there's a serious insurrection somewhere in Uzbekistan or, or Tajikistan. 
Uh, in the pers in Euro Russia right now has lots of uh, problems with the West, with NATO and Europe, but it's well understood that China is not really part of that game and is not anywhere close to there. In the Pacific, uh, the Chinese interests are more uh, Western, uh, Eastern Chinese Sea, South China Sea. Russia's uh, a point of gravitation is much more north. It's the Sea of Okhotsk, which right now is being turned into a kind of fortress, the building of the Pacific defensive rim to make the Sea of Okhotsk a fortress for Russian strategic nuclear submarine carried ICBMs actually uh, aimed at the United States. And again, China is not really a serious actor there. There, of course, is the Korea problem where both sides could get involved. So uh, Russia and China are in the process of kind of moving closer to each other. Maybe in some areas it could already be closer to a military alliance, but still right now, most of the interests, the serious interests, are compartmentalized. Um, for years, media on both sides uh, must have done a lot of uh, surveys as to the approval rating or mutual trust. What is the current uh, popular sentiment in Russia about the image of China? Uh, uh, taking. Far East Siberia, as an example, there is the growing population of uh, Chinese farmers who help our Russian friends uh, do farming, but they won't necessarily win trust because of the history of this uh, uh, big chunk of the Russian territory. Well, beginning of the, from the 90s, there was a lot of mistrust between Russia and China that was a legacy of the standoff during the Cold War in the in 60s and 70s and 80s. Right now, it's different in public opinion. China is seen as a friendly nation, and actually the number of Chinese that try to uh, or settle or work in the Far East is limited. It's well understood uh, that uh, if Chinese want to emigrate from China for work, they would maybe prefer California to Kamchatka. <laughs> so, uh, but there is some residual mistrust in the Russian elites, in the Russian military, to some extent. Uh, but right now, it's much lower. The majority of Russians see uh, China favorably. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, Thank you for being with us. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would add I'd one thing. I was very interested in Pavel's uh, description of the former USSR and I think this is one of the one of the sticking points between Russia and China I don't think that China is looking for a rebuilding of USSR under Russia mm -hmm. I think that uh, they prefer the situation it is now now obviously Putin has may have other feelings about that and that will continue to be a contentious point as we've seen in economic affairs maybe enough has been discussed between <coughs> us about the issue of transparency and the mutual trust uh, uh, between and among the parties here in the war game. Now, the most unpredictable maverick or political force in this area, I'm afraid, is President Duterte. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. This guy is accused uh, by the American government of uh, using the SOB to humiliate uh, President Obama, who will step down in two months. But having said this, um, he, uh, President Duterte said uh, openly that he's going to buy arms from Russia and China. Mm -hmm. He's going to oust American Marines from an area where uh, the Americans join hand with the Filipino troops uh, in fighting Apsayev, mm -hmm. uh, a mm -hmm. terrorist organization there. What's happening there? Don't you think this guy will be assassinated by CIA, <laughs> like what happened in the, in the Cold War? Uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, this is the uh, mm. best choice for the new uh, Filipino president at this moment to have a more balanced relations uh, between the Philippines and uh, the United States, between Philippines and China and other you know, uh, major powers in this region, in the world. And uh, so they can have more chances, to, for example, to uh, develop uh, their social life and also give a very good driving forces for the economic development in the country. And uh, uh, if we look at the policy taken by you know, Aquino III, actually this is only one uh, pro-American uh, policy. Uh, it's a failure. Thank you very much. We don't have enough time to discuss the uh, impact that President Duterte would deliver to Crazy the like uh, stability and the security <laughs> in the South China Sea. I promise to bring you guys back and uh, continue our discussion, <laughs> which is very sexy. Yeah. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.